Thanks for joining me. Thanks for joining Contagion. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. So today we are going to talk a little bit about your role as an antibiotic steward and how that's been impacted by the pandemic. And I wanted to start by establishing a bit about, some of our viewers will recognize you, but um, a bit about what you were up to on and your day-to-day -day before the pandemic started. Sure. So I do global antibiotic stewardship, and we have a very robust program at Ohio State University that I've been involved with for decades, but really transitioned to global work. And in February, I was to start a new appointment with the World Health Organization. Based on my work in South Africa for the last nine years, I had helped in 2018 and 19, the WHO develop an antibiotic stewardship toolkit for low middle income countries. They have many different barriers to implementing stewardship. And one of the biggest barriers is they do not have infectious disease trained pharmacists in their countries. And they have just a handful of infectious disease trained physicians. So many things we take for granted in the United States don't exist there. And so how do you implement stewardship? It takes a different set of skills. And that's really what I've been working on for nine years in South Africa. In my new assignment with the WHO, I was selected as one of 25 global healthcare experts to actually impl implement the toolkit that was developed and published at the end of 2019. So the third week of February, I was to be in Bangkok, Thailand, but we all know now, um, Bangkok, Thailand, all of the Asian countries were uh, in the midst of the start of COVID-19. And that obviously was canceled. So um, my next adventure uh, was in, in uh, March. I was to be on my way to South Africa to implement an antibiotic stewardship study in neonatal patients um, that we were ready to conduct over two years. And it was the call to action for the pharmacists that were going to participate. And obviously that got put on hold as the state of Ohio where I live implemented shelter at home orders um, at the beginning of March. So you look at, well, what are you gonna do? As an infectious disease expert, I looked at the information coming out every day on COVID. I would read everything. And in the very beginning, it was challenging, but you could keep up on it. You know, one study coming from China, New England Journal of Medicine, two days later, there's a Lancet paper. And I would go to bed thinking, okay, I've got everything under control. And then I'd get up in the morning and there'd be four more papers and, you know, wait a minute, don't do that. Now they say this. And I was just finding information overload. And our hospital, as many did, um, you know, you really had to streamline the workflow of healthcare providers. And so uh, we made a decision that there would only be uh, one intensive care unit pharmacist actually physically in the hospital and the rest would work remotely. So I was working remotely. And I thought, you know, if I'm having trouble synthesizing all of this data, how does just the common person who is like, what, what do you mean we're under shelter at home for a virus? This can't be happening in the United States. What is this and what am I supposed to do? I thought if I'm having trouble processing all the data, how are other people that aren't ID experts or just lay people in the community keeping up with it? And I've always uh, been very active in publishing and writing and communication. And so I decided I'm going to start writing. And so what I chose to do um, is, is somewhat different. I started writing for my own community, the Highland Lakes newsletter, as I watched all the kids acting as if it was spring break playing in the street, I'm like that is not social distancing because all of this was so new to everybody. Um, you know, I don't think parents even understood it. It's like, okay, we're all home. We'll go outside and play kids. And it really turned our world upside down. And so as I saw that, I thought, how does just my next door neighbor understand that is a tremendous risk to your entire family having your children out there playing. So I wrote this newsletter of 
10 facts and really called it COVID community collaboration. And, you know, we have over a thousand homes in this development and the feedback, you know, when I sent it to our, our homeowners association, A, they were like, oh my gosh, we have our own infectious disease expert from Ohio State University right here willing to write something for us. But it was really important because you needed to write in a way that the next door neighbor could understand. So I started with that. And when I saw how um, engaged people became, just as I would walk outside, uh, socially distancing, of course, um, and people would go, oh my gosh, Debbie, A, I didn't know that's what you did for a living, but it really helped me understand why my kids shouldn't all be playing together with all the neighborhood kids. And so I was like, okay. And then, you know, because I work for a large academic medical center, we have public relations people that try to, um, as news media comes for stories or wants to interview a healthcare provider, we have to have permission and they vet us. And so that's someone I've worked with. So I called them and I said, hey, listen, any kind of news stories you want to get out, I will help you. And they're like, we would absolutely love that. And so I wrote for Prevention Magazine, How to Clean Your Cell Phone the Proper Way, got tremendous feedback on that. Ohio State has a blog available for our healthcare providers at the whole university, which is 64,000 students along with faculty, not just the medical center employees. And so there was actually a strategy as we were running out of gloves for our frontline healthcare providers in the very beginning of COVID. You know, we saw people in grocery stores wearing sterile gloves. Well, you know, where are they getting them from? That supply needs to come to the healthcare providers. So they asked me to write a story, is wearing gloves an effective defense against COVID-19? And really what it takes to properly take them on and off to actually have them work as a barrier to COVID. And most people that don't do medicine don't really know how to remove a sterile glove without contaminating yourself in the process. So I uh, wrote that. So OSU really helped guide the news media to have me help advocate for problems that we were identifying and how to write a story that everyone could understand. Um, wrote about shaking hands, is that gonna be a thing of the past? Um, that's our human, abil human interaction as we have always had that greeting socially. Um, you know, they've asked, are we gonna never be able to shake hands? And what is the risk of that? Um, wrote that story. And then importantly, other um, areas, uh, news articles, other pharmacy journals, such as like pharmacy practice news, they were looking for articles. And I saw this as a way to really get the stories of some of my frontline colleagues that are in the hospital providing direct patient care um, to get their story out there. And so I wrote, and I, I really felt in the very beginning, I have never seen an, an infectious disease that requires as much collaboration as COVID-19. It became very clear this is not just a disease that requires infectious disease expertise. You need ICU expertise. You need anticoagulation expertise. I mean, the list just kept going on and on. Dermatology expertise as we develop COVID toes. I mean, this virus has just caused us to really learn how to collaborate as one. Because it's not just what antiviral you're going to give them. If you don't know how to intubate properly, your healthcare providers get the, the COVID-19. We had engineers at Ohio State. Um, listen to our anesthesiologists and the frontline physicians that had to intubate saying, I'm terrified of getting this. And could you create a plastic shield or something that would make me able to see my patient but not get sprayed as they start coughing and all the logistics. The College of Engineering came up with literally overnight a, a plastic shield that you can put your hands in as they go to intubate but if the patient gags or throws up or spits at you, you're not gonna get splashed. Even though they had N95s on um, and face, face shields, those were not available to every healthcare provider at the very beginning as we ran out of 
PPE equipment in various hospitals. So to me, it was just an amazing disease to watch how you had to learn to collaborate. And that's something I've done my whole career with stewardship. And not just collaboration amongst healthcare providers in our hospital, but also global collaboration. You know, China saw it first because they were where it started. And so the first publications were coming from China, but then Italy became the hotbed. And our colleagues in Italy, what they were publishing, um, I use social media and Twitter. Um, you could learn on Twitter firsthand people surviving COVID or frontline providers, what their emotional feelings were. You know, things that aren't um, a medical journal article, but to listen to a, to be able to read a thread by a anesthesiologist or a nurse or a physician or a pharmacist right there in the ICU, what they're personally feeling in some of the hospitals where they didn't even have N95 masks or they didn't have gowns. And, you know, you're putting your own life at risk to go care for these patients, to have a patient die without the family even being present. Um, you know, a lot of reflection of what it took to manage this disease and really the heroics and, and sort of the other thing that I started noticing um, working from home, you know, you can watch the news a lot where generally I'm not home and that's not something I'm sitting there watching. You know, we want to recognize the heroes, the physicians and the nurses and never, ever, ever did I hear a pharmacist mentioned. Mm. I sat there going, yeah. why does no one know we're in the hospital taking care of these patients. We are strategizing on all of the drug therapy. Our drug information colleagues are identifying once we decided to try to decrease nursing exposure in the rooms by having to respond to medical, um, all the beeps from the uh, pumps when they alarm, you know, would require new PPE equipment. Well, that just was, not good because we didn't have enough. So could you put the pump outside of the room? Well, that required 20 foot tubing. And so now you don't know if the drug we're infusing, obviously you need a whole lot more of the drug and there's drug shortages, but is it stable in a 20 foot tubing? Because it's never been studied that way. Well, who's answering that important question? That's called the pharmacist. And so our role was instrumental in the care of these patients but never, never were we recognized by any healthcare professional speaking publicly. I don't want to say healthcare professional. The physicians clearly know were their advocates and work one-on-one -on -one with them in the hospital. But people um, publicly speaking that don't work in hospitals. It wasn't a huge part of the public health message. Uh, it was not at all, in my opinion. And I'm not the only one to notice that. So on Twitter, there's a lot of that um, taking place. And why are pharmacists not even being acknowledged? And, you know, when you point it out, uh, people are like, oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. But it really told me the learning lesson I've gotten so far from 10 weeks of shelter at home. We are an unknown healthcare provider in the hospital setting. And that really is something our profession needs to work on. So uh, that is something that people are starting to write about. And it's not just about being recognized. It's really about having patients and consumers understand your healthcare is better because you have a pharmacist present, making sure you get the right drug at the right dose at the right duration, because every drug has a side effect. And in COVID, you know, we're learning by the moment what to do. So, you know, the pharmacist is instrumental in synthesizing all of the data on remdesivir, tocilizumab, hydroxychloroquine. The physician is concentrating on, you know, do I need to intubate this patient? How do I manage this ARDS? And they're looking to us to say, here's what is up to date at this point, and here's the data, and together we make a decision. We're gonna give this patient this drug. We're gonna give this person hydroxychloroquine. We're gonna give this one remdesivir. We're gonna give this tos tosiluzumab. 
you know, that's a joint decision, but we are really the ones helping to synthesize the volumes of data coming at us. And, you know, it, it'd be nice to have that acknowledged outside of the hospital. Our colleagues in the hospital, the nurses, the pharma, the physicians, the microbiologists, we talk every day. There's, there's no need to recognize there because we work as one team. But it is um, disturbing to me that the profession of pharmacy was really never even mentioned as an essential healthcare provider, which makes me think the stereotype of a pharmacist is in the community dispensing medicine, period. And, you know, 40 years ago, that was true. But I've worked in the career a long time. It just bothers me that it seems the public perception is still the same. Right. I mean, the word for... The word pharmacist does not conjure up the kind of uh, flexible role, but um, since I've started working in infectious disease journalism, I've discovered that it mm -hmm. refers to. Um, it really, and this isn't to say that people doing this aren't doing important work, but it really only conjures up in the public imagination this idea of the kind of drugstore um, right. pharmacist, right? right? And they do... They, they're part of this all too, but the clinical pharmacy, like especially in the hospital or even outpatient, isn't under that same focus, despite being part right. of the team. Right. I, I honestly think most consumers don't even know we're in the hospital participating in direct patient care. I think they know there's a pharmacy in the hospital, um, but you know, the pharmacist in the community is the most accessible healthcare provider. You can walk into any pharmacy and get medical advice without paying. You, you can't really walk into a doctor's office and get medical advice without paying to no. see the doctor. And so, you know, we're a very trusted profession and we're very accessible. And so it just makes me wonder why don't they know we're in the hospital? And I think that's on us. And so that's part of what I'm writing is, is changing that picture. We need to have a really advocacy campaign that consumers understand. And to me, it very much parallels antibiotic stewardship. We know we have been talking for 15 years. We're running out of effective antibiotics. Antibiotic resistance is escalating. If we don't do something, you know, hundreds of thousands of deaths will occur by 2050. And, you know, the UK published a great report predicting all of that. Well, the Wellcome Trust Foundation three months ago published a great report stating consumers don't understand our message. They just simply don't get it. And so why don't they get it? And they feel, this report stated, that the message is too complex. We use words that really don't translate to non-medical people. Antimicrobial is not even understood. People don't even know what that is. So saying antibiotic stewardship is, is best, even though antifungals aren't an antibiotic. You have to make it so people understand it. And so, you know, it took us how long to figure out no one's understanding our message. <laughs> Um, a long time. So I'm paralleling why do consumers not know there's pharmacists in the hospital intimately involved in the care of their drug therapy and overall management. We're just going to, I'm going to piggyback it onto the same stewardship message and try to keep that moving forward. Well, and those are, and those are so related. I mean, yes. to increase the visibility of pharmacists is to increase the visibility of my, of antibiotic stewardship. Yep. Absolutely. I mean, it is drug therapy and that's what we're an expert at. So, you know, when you look at doing antibiotic stewardship, the lion's share of the work in the hospital setting is done by the infectious disease pharmacist. And, you know, physicians are a part of it, but the day-to-day, -day, you know, calling up the physician, changing the antibiotic, um, you know, telling them it's not necessary, all those calls and interactions are generally done by the pharmacist, uh, which is fine. I mean, that's a, an incredibly important role. But in that, it is trying to influence their behavior. You know, you're trying to change something that physicians have been doing for 20 years, 
prescribing an antibiotic that they perceive as safe and effective and does no harm. So you try to unravel that thought process. It takes a lot of time and energy and work. And, uh, you know, it's, it's great. It's a great initiative, but it is hard. So paralleling on top of that, the role of a pharmacist to the community uh, that you're practicing in to have them realize, you know, we do more than dispensing medicine in the retail type setting. In the hospital, hospital pharmacists are doing far more than that. You know, that's something our societies can take up. We have great leadership in our national societies. That messaging has been very clear to me with COVID-19. The public doesn't understand our role at all. I, I'm sort of, I'm reminded of all the papers that came out last year that showed that infectious disease consult uh, had positive yes. uh, beneficial effects on mortality Yes, in, in all sorts of different situations. I think sepsis was one that was highlighted uh, in one of the big papers. Staph aureus um, bacteremia, candidemia. Yes. Yeah. So I think, um, I, I mean, I imagine if you could look at, um, if you could look at outcomes for mm -hmm. COVID-19, and I mean, I, I don't know if we really have the time to collect the data on this, you know, with set up studies like that, but I, I imagine that like the close involvement of, of pharmacists is, is going to have an impact on on the kind of care people receive, especially you know the more and more that we get data on these therapeutics. Yes, and I really commend um, the American College of Clinical Pharmacists (ACCP) and SIDP, the Society of Infectious Disease Pharmacists, have been really documenting the role of the clinical pharmacist. So ACCP put a call out: Tell us what you're doing as a clinical pharmacist and it's posted to their website. What are you doing? All of our practices have changed. You know, working remotely is very different. Talking to the physician who's rounding on the patient over the telephone and they're carrying a mobile phone from room to room is different than human touch and being at the side of the bed to see the patient and, and really watch their progress from day to day. Because sometimes, you know, if you just sit at a computer and look at patient data, you think, oh, wow, this patient's really doing poorly today. But you go up and they're sitting there reading the newspaper and you're, the labs, there's a total disconnect. Or sometimes the other way around, the labs all look great. And you go up and you're like, oh my gosh, they don't look good today. Like you just get this very bad feeling. So there's great value in actually being at the side of the bed to make those assessments. But all of us are practicing in, in different models right now, um, whether it be from home or just with limited resources. You know, our ICU pharmacist, it's one pharmacist now for the entire ICU versus the seven we typically have. So you can't clearly spend as much time per patient. There's just not enough hours. So you know, it's caused for a lot of adjustment in our practices, but that's okay. And so those societies are documenting that. Tell us what you're doing um, because it is a different time, but we want to document the role of a pharmacist. And I absolutely assure you, collecting outcomes of patients and what pharmacists did to help improve that outcome there's been a lot of the out of the box thinking, you know, putting the pumps outside the room so the nurse doesn't have to go in every time it gets an air bubble and alarms and causes you to change all the PPE again. Um, you know, infusing drugs with a 20 foot IV <laughs> tubing versus, you know, 12 inches is a big difference. And, you know, that's the pharmacist that figured out, is it stable? Is there any problems doing this? There's so many ways we've contributed to improved care of a COVID patient in the hospital setting. Um, but even my colleagues in the ambulatory care, oh my goodness, they set up a COVID ambulatory care clinic to manage all of the anticoagulants that patients are going out on. So we learned, you know, a lot of COVID patients are hypercoagulable and having blood clots. 
And so they're now on Coumadin and different agents as they leave the hospital and you barely have time to talk to them. Those are really dangerous drugs and they require monitoring. There's a COVID drive up ambulatory care clinic to get your warfarin INR finger stick times um, monitored. I mean, that's so novel. That's, you know, responding to an unmet need and that's our ambulatory care pharmacist. You know, I think it's, it's quite amazing. And just the other ways, you know, we just finished a, a webinar today with our pharmacist colleagues in Doha, Qatar. Uh, they are just starting the surge and they wanted to learn from us. So I think it's a great way to show global collaboration. You know, I talked to colleagues in Italy that were way ahead of us in terms of what they were seeing. And you can follow people on Twitter if you don't know them personally and just get a sense of this. Just put in hashtag COVID-19 and you can get more than you'll ever want to read. But in terms of medically caring for patients, observed what they were seeing. Well, then our colleagues in Qatar contacted me. Could you tell us what you've learned so far? Because you're ahead of us. So we're on the downslope, thank goodness. Um, as we have now released our shelter at home orders and are starting to go back to uh, normality. Uh, so I think it's an amazing time to learn that global collaboration. It's, it's a great opportunity. Well, and that, that actually gets me thinking. I mean, it's, I was going to ask what the resumption of your earlier work would look like, but it sounds like there's an extent to which virtually you're at least continuing the spirit of what you were doing before the, before the pandemic. And, and, and so, I mean, there is a sense in which, yes, like I do, I do wonder how do we get back? Like how, how will the transition back to those kinds of global antibiotic stewardship efforts? What will that look like? How gradually does that have to take place? Mm -hmm. That kind of thing. But to the point I just made and to your point about global uh, cooperation, it's not that it's just been shut off like a valve either. No, and I mean, I think just this technology you and I are using today with Zoom, you know, you realize you actually can accomplish a lot without physically traveling somewhere. I mean, human interaction will never be replaced by a Zoom meeting, a webinar. Um, but has my work in South Africa stopped? Absolutely not. I'm on conference calls with them. Again, the United States is ahead of South Africa in COVID. I'm teaching them, here. tell me what drugs you have available because they don't have remdesivir. They don't have what we have. So again, it's kind of like the antibiotic stewardship toolkit. They have fewer tools in their toolkit, but it doesn't mean you sit back and go, oh, well, we don't have anything to work with because every patient will die. So tell me what you've got and let me help you strategize how to use them effectively and safer. And you know, a lot of COVID patients on admission have bilateral whiteout of their chest x-rays. And so you know, physicians, what do they do? Okay, I know it's probably COVID, but I'm gonna throw on three antibiotics just in case it's a bacterial infection, of which we've just learned from a brand new CID publication you know, almost 80% receive antibiotics, but only 8% actually have a bacterial co-infection. So how do you continue good stewardship in the midst of COVID? So that's the pharmacist that's going to be there constantly reminding the physician. I know you started triple antibiotics, but now that we've confirmed they are COVID positive and, you know, their white count is not going up, how about if we start removing some of the antibiotics? Because these are life and death patients and you don't have a rapid diagnostic test to tell you for sure it's not a bacterial co-infection. Um, so I understand the, the need to prescribe antibiotics, um, but now once you get it confirmed, you've gotta be able to start pulling back. So there's a lot of ways I continue to collaborate um, globally and continue doing the work that I've been doing. It just doesn't allow me to physically travel to countries. So I appreciate all the insight you've shared. I wanna ask one, and I mean, you're welcome to touch on anything else you'd like as well to, to wrap up uh, before you answer this. But um, just with everything that's been going on, everybody's had months of this, there's like crazy burnout for a lot of people. So I wanted to ask if there was a, 
positive um, experience that you um, like with patients uh, or your colleagues mm -hmm. that you felt like sharing, something you were proud of? Yeah. No, I mean, I think some of the really great things that came out of COVID and having to work at home, um, because you have zero interruptions, um, I've gotten a whole lot more done. And I actually turned to looking at grants to help continue the educational process. And so I, I wrote a couple grants to provide COVID education with people that I generally have never worked with, but I knew as we transition patients to the outpatient setting, how are those pharmacists in the community pharmacy setting gonna deal with um, the ability to do COVID testing? That's great, pharmacists got approved to do that. Um, how are they going to handle testing patients and giving patients knowledge if you have to tell them uh, you are COVID positive. You know, what do they do if they're standing in your store? So I started to partner with our retail community pharmacist, which is not a, a group I've generally worked with because I work in the inpatient hospital setting. But I realized we've got to work as one or those patients are going to be right back in the hospital. And then really just continuing to stay engaged with my colleagues that I work with in as I continue to move forward with educating people, um, realizing it's not just infectious disease expertise, I've been able to coordinate my anticoagulation pharmacist, my solid organ transplant pharmacist, my ICU pharmacist into webinars that generally have just been asking me to participate. But I'm like, this is not something I can ever do by myself. We need a village and I'm gonna bring my, um, teammates from work that are uh, providing really effective COVID care, comprehensive care. And so that's been kind of fun because I know them as friends, but I don't work day to day with them and bringing them in on a collaborative effort uh, for COVID management of patients has been really a positive thing for me. That's, um, that's great. And I think it's the kind of thing that will uh, hopefully inspire people to uh, when you know there's a voice out there, uh, feel free to help raise it. Um, send them Contagion's way. We're, we're more, I more than happy. I retweet you often. Yeah. <laughs> great job. Much appreciated. All right. Well, take care. I hope you have a great rest of your day. And thank you again for coming. Thank you. Have a great day. Thanks for having me.